Today I'm here to talk about lessons learned, the things that we learned uh, during the Ebola outbreaks, both here in the United States at Emory University and outside of the United States when we were working in Liberia and Nigeria with healthcare workers. Simply throwing personal protective equipment out and saying that this is exactly what you need to be safer is simply not going to work because if we don't train people on how to use the power or the, the, the uh, personal protective equipment and we don't give people protocols and we don't provide opportunities for them to learn and master the, the, the art of donning and doffing PPE properly, then basically what we're doing is we're increasing their confidence by giving them what they need, but then when they go to do it, they drown. So it's almost like teaching someone how to swim in a kiddie pool and then throwing them in a big pool and asking them to be able to demonstrate the same behavior. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nina Pham, and I've won the lottery. And today, I am cashing it in because I feel so lucky to be here today to serve as your advocate. In sharing my story today, I hope to serve as a reminder that what happened to me could have happened to any of us and that we need to fight for better protection and preparedness for our nurses and frontline healthcare workers. And uh, good morning again. My name is Sean Kaufman, and I have won the lottery because I'm standing here on the stage with Miss Nina Pham. Uh, I have to say, Nina is a very beautiful lesson. Would you agree? <laughs> yes, give her a round of applause. Very good. And a lesson will continue to present itself until it's learned. And I think that's the motto of the presentation today. If you go to CDC's website and you look up HAI, Healthcare Associated Illnesses, you'll see that on any given day, about 1 in 25 hospital patients has at least one healthcare-associated infection. And of that, in 2011, there were an estimated 722,000 HAIs in the United States Acute Care Hospitals. Again, this is coming straight from the, the front page of HAIs in the statistics page of CDC. And the last one is about 75,000 hospital patients with HAIs died during their hospitalizations. Look, this, just a mere fact, I think, in fact, I know we can do better. I know we can in hospital settings. And I want to share with you a little bit of the experiences that I've had. Of course, we all know Florence Nightingale. Now, as a public health person who studied health promotion, and health education, I like to claim Florence Nightingale is the first health educator. Now, nurses will quickly remind me that that's not the case. She was the first nurse, and her care was her patients. She wanted to keep her patients safe and prevent secondary infections, and she did a wonderful job doing that. Well, back in the 1940s, we learned that Germany and Japan were using biological weapons to kill people during World War II. The United States in the early 1940s decided to start an offensive biological weapons program. That means that we would play with the most dangerous pathogens in controlled laboratory environments, trying to, in essence, release weapons to people that would hurt them. But if we killed our scientists in the process of doing that, we would lose our intellectual property and our ability to continue to develop weapons. So biosafety was born in the 1940s, well after infection control. But biosafety's premise was not focusing on the agent. Biosafety's premise was focusing on the safety of the workforce, 100%. And that's the biggest lesson that I learned when serving at Emory and in the field in Africa is that nurses and doctors, they seem to care so much about their patient that they forget about themselves. And in biosafety, in the laboratory, we don't care about the agent. We can grow more. It's all about the protection of us. And so I think what we do and what we're going to talk about later on today is the blending of those two professions. Why can't we learn from a profession that has been workforce driven against some of the most dangerous infectious diseases? And I produce or I say to all of you as you go forward, the blending of infection control and biosafety is a clinical containment. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those lessons as we go forward. Before this happened, I would ask, What's the worst disease you work with, Dad? Now, for 12 years, uh, well, I worked at CDC many, but for 12 years, I taught laboratory scientists to work in high containment labs. You know the spacesuit labs? The PAPRs, the BSL-3? It wasn't influenza, top killer. It wasn't TB, top killer. These are things you guys see on every day. Certainly, it wasn't HIV. I used to tell my kids Ebola. Now, that was a big foot in the mouth because all of a sudden, you tell your children for years that Ebola is the most dangerous thing, and the next thing you know... 
you're being called to work with Ebola and you can't really retract now. You can't go backwards. But you guys are on the front line. You're facing some serious threats. Ebola is, Ebola is nothing compared to what's coming. You've got MERS, you've got SARS, you've got influenza that could be very high path. You've got MRSA, you've got TB, you've got a lot of emerging infectious diseases. And today, Nina and I are going to share our story of kind of how we intersected. Now, I want you to notice the date here. July 30th. July 30th, I was called to Emory's isolation unit. And they said, Sean, are we ready to work with Ebola? And they showed me what they were doing. And I said, no. And they were surprised. I mean, the nurses were taking about, what do you mean, no? We've been training for this. CDC gave us money. We've been... I said, absolutely not. First and foremost, your premise that Ebola is like HIV is completely out of whack. They said, what do you mean? I said, listen, I worked at hospice with people dying from opportunistic infections as a result of AIDS-related complications. And no one was ever vomiting or diarrheaing or hemorrhaging high quantities of virus at unpredictable mo moments in this time. We had a very peaceful death, actually. And you guys are going to be walking into rooms where these patients could be doing that at any given time, and you've got limited PPE and limited skill and ability to deal with this at unpredictable situations. No, you're not ready. Well, that was Wednesday, July 30th. At 4 a.m. on Thursday, July 31st, the cut began. We started with roughly about 75 nurses. We cut them down to about 15. Not everybody who wants to work with Ebola gets to work with Ebola. You have to have balance because you're wearing a lot of PPE. You have to have, have, to have attention to detail. Look, we're not looking for Bob Marley. You know what I'm talking about, nurses. The nurses, there's nurses out there that are very relaxed and they just do it. And then there are nurses that pay attention to every single detail. We are looking for nurses that paid attention to every single detail, could pick things up quickly. It wasn't that the rest of the 75 couldn't. It was that we needed people to pick it up quickly because we only had two more days before Dr. Brantley arrived. So the big cut occurred on July 31st when we started our training all day. On Friday, August 1st, we built the family. We set up expectations. We're going to take care of one another. We're not going to have cancer in this, in this room. We're going to be positive. We're going to report incidents and accidents, and no one's going to get in trouble because competency has already been determined at the door. If someone makes a mistake, that means everybody is at the same opportunity of making the same mistake. And as a family, we're going to learn from those mistakes so we don't repeat them. We came together, and we, we celebrated a family. Now, that was on Friday. Saturday is football day in Georgia. And I'm a football coach. Right, son? Dad, you're a football coach. Where were you? The greatest uh, thing that happened to me that was very, very different about my experience at Emory was typically I go into laboratory environments. I train. It's an intensive training. It's simulation-based. That's what I do. I'm a behavioral psychologist. Sorry, I'm not a scientist. I love behavior. That's what I focus on. So we do simulation training. And... I would train laboratory and staff, and then I would leave. That's what I would do. Well, when I got to pack in my bags to get ready for the football game on Saturday, the nurses at Emory said, Sean, uh, please, uh, uh, don't go. We're not ready. Can you stay? And I was like, wait, wait, you, you want me to stay? Yes. Got suited up, and for the next 12 days, for 17 hours every day, every single nurse that went in and out of that place, I donned, we doffed, and we sat through and even cleaned up spills together hand in hand. It was some of the best 12 days of my life. It was incredible. And to witness, it was also the first time I witnessed what you guys do. Because during that time, if you look at Dr. Brantley's book, he was very nice in mentioning certain circumstances that included names. One of them, I'm going to get grief about. The other one was okay. Well, like Nina, Dr. Brantley, who comes from the same area that Nina does, asked for Chick-fil-A. His first meal of feeling good. You don't give somebody Chick-fil-A when they've been sick because something happens. <laughs> and boy, did it happen. And Dr. Brantley writes about it in his book. And he says, my God, this is our first spill in the unit. And Sean Cobb and the compliance officer came in, and he basically, we cleaned the spill. The nurses panicked. There's Ebola. I mean, it was everywhere. And it's funny because I'm standing there, and I'm watching the nurses, and we're in the unit, 
and he's, you know, gone to the bath, and they're cleaning him. I'm, whoa, whoa, I didn't know y'all do that. I thought, I'd take a little towel and go, hey, you know, you got a little here, you know. But you all dove in. They dove in, no fear. I was like, holy, you know, I mean, it's the first time I started to understand something. I mean, wow, y'all do some serious work. I mean, no, for me, you clean up some serious shit. But anyway. <laughs> Dr. Brantley and his wife, Amber, are beautiful, as was their family. And again, it was an unbelievable experience. But after uh, those 12 days, when, there, when Dr. Brantley and Nancy's viral loads were undetectable, which is well before many of us knew in the public, I shipped off. My journey with Ebola and patients started July 31st. And my story starts Monday, September 29, 2014. Um, it was just like any other Monday coming in for my shift. Um, it was my first of three in a row. I come into the unit, get my patient assignment. Have, I have two patients, move them out by noon, of course, typical, right? Um, and then there's, and then I'm the next open bed. Um, I get my charge nurse and my manager, supervisor, they come up to me and they're like, Nina, we need you to come to our office. So I'm like, okay. And I come into their office, they sit me down, they tell me, Nina, we have a patient in the ER that we are ruling out for Ebola. And I was like, excuse me? <laughs> um, what did you say? And they said, we have a patient that we're ruling out for Ebola. And I was shocked and asked them, like, are you, sh are you sure? Like, Ebola in the US, it's, it's here. Um, and then they go and they show me a handout from the CDC website and said, this is what we're following. And at the time, the guidelines were your basic contact precautions, gown, masks, gloves and booties and they're from the CDC so being me a semi newish nurse like how do you question the CDC right so I was like okay if, if everyone's reassuring me that every hospital in the US can take care of Ebola then I guess it must be true so there a few hours pass by we have uh, some meetings in the unit just to debrief everyone on the on the situation and that's so that's a, I got the news around noon and about 445 was when he came up to the unit and they had told me at the time he was more of a med surge patient he wasn't technically ICU criteria criteria but that they wanted him to be in the ICU just in case he were to eventually decline and we would have we would avoid having to move him around the hospital so I set up the room as I normally did and went in there, did my initial assessment. Um, he was feverish, just having chills and having diarrhea, vomiting, your typical like symptoms. Um, took care of him for the rest of my shift until seven o'clock and then came back the next day, Tuesday. And things were changing every day. The first day, I wore the basic contact precautions. The second day, we moved on to using TV masks instead of surgical masks. And then by the third day, I finally got the hazmat suits. So we were changing protocols every day. The first day, I left work in the same scrubs that I had come in. The second day, we, we um, rigged up an ante room with a shower. And everything just changed every day. And it was like, and it was like the nurses that were fighting for um, added equipment because we had nurses that had worked at other hospitals that were wearing hazmat suits for H1N1 and they were like, you know, we wore hazmat suits for H1N1, why aren't we wearing them for Ebola? So it was very nurse driven in our unit at that point, just scrambling for supplies and asking the leadership for more supplies. And Tuesday is what I call D-Day. And D-Day means is diagnosis day. And come on to my shift, take care of him. And up around noon again was when we had a confirmation that he had Ebola. And then it was breaking news. And I was actually one of the, besides Duncan, the last person to find out that he was positive. 
And so coming home that night, I had a lot of fear about coming back the next day. I called my charge nurse that night and I talked with him for a good hour about, you know, is it worth the risk of me risking my life for this patient? And, you know, I slept on it and then Wednesday, the next day, I decided to come back because I had committed to taking care of him and I knew that, I've, that if I were to call in, it would have been another nurse having to go in there and take care of him. And so Wednesday was my third shift in a row with him. Um, he was a lot more ill at that point. He couldn't get out of the bed. We had put a rectal tube in him by that point because it was just coming out so, so frequently. Um, and I remember it was all over the news, obviously, because it had just broken that he was confirmed positive for Ebola. And I remember him being very scared and feeling very isolated and alone, as you would. And being from West Africa, like there was like sort of a language barrier, and he couldn't see anybody or touch anybody. And I remember telling him that, you know, it's been a pleasure taking care of him for the past three days, and that I'd be off for the next another three days or so and that I, um, that I would miss him and he said he thanked me for taking care of him and that he said he would miss me too and that was the last time I was able to talk to him and so Sunday through Tuesday October 5th through the 7th I took a care of him again for another three shifts um, October 5th I came on to my shift and he had been intubated at that point so Every day, he just got more and more critical. He ended up on continuous dialysis, intubated, on pressors, paralyzed, tube feedings, you name it. There was every ICU equipment in the room. And on, finally, on Tuesday the 7th, I came on to my shift. And by that point, we had moved from me just being one primary nurse on the first day to having four nurses on him and we would rotate two hour shifts at a time. We would have two nurses inside the room um, as primary and then two on the outside of the room as the buddy nurses. So we would be on the outside charting or grabbing medications to hand into the room. So that day I was the buddy nurse. So as the outside nurse, come on to my shift around seven o'clock. We get our usual morning um, report and we had heard that he had uh, declined overnight. They had to add some pressors to keep his blood pressure stable overnight. His, his belly became hard, and so we knew something was, something was up. Um, the nurses went into the room for their usual morning assessment and a respiratory therapist to check the vent, and we were communicating to their nurses inside the room with walkie-talkies. So I remember it was just after seven, I looked into the room, they're doing their assessment, and I noticed, and, he, and his heart rate had been um, tachycardic this whole time, really, and all of a sudden I noticed it was 60, and then it was 50, and then it was 40, and then I, you know, I tell the other nurse that I'm with on the outside to go get the crash cart. He's a limited DNR at this point, so he was already intubated and he was, um, there was no compression, so all we did was a few rounds of ACLS drugs and then called time of death. So he passed away right pretty early on that shift, and it was pretty devastating for all of us. Um, we just kind of held each other and, and cried the rest of the day and just debriefed for, we stayed at the hospital like well after he had been, um, we, they did post-mortem care on him. They had people come in and seal his body in a bag and then take him off to wherever they took him off to. But we just kind of debriefed with each other. And then the next day I was off. Um, and I took my dog Bentley to the dog park as I normally did on my days off. And I started getting allergies, or what I thought was allergies. I was sneezing, feeling congested just under the weather. And I had been self-monitoring my temperature the whole time. I'd been taking care of Mr. Duncan, and I usually run kind of low in the, in the 97 range. And then on Friday, I wake up with a 99.5 low-grade fever, which was abnormal for me. So I was a little bit concerned. So I 
called one of my ICU doctors that I work with and that I, I trust, and I asked him, hey, should I be concerned? Should I tell someone about this? And he said, yes, just to be safe. And so I called employee health, which they told all the nurses to call. Um, we developed a fever, and they gave us a threshold of 100.4 as the threshold to, to come into the ER. And I, I called employee health. They told me it wasn't above the threshold, so I didn't need to. I just needed to kept, keep monitoring my temperature. And then I also called um, my contact for the CDC in the area, and she also told me the same thing, that I needed to just keep monitoring my temperature. And I even asked them if I needed to stay away from public areas or people, because I, I had plans that night to go to dinner, and she said no. Um, but thankfully, I felt a little bit worse throughout the day, so I decided to cancel my plans that night and just hang around the house with my dog. And so Friday night, turning into Saturday midnight, I wake up with um, a fever, sweats, feeling hot. So that's, that's what woke me up. Um, I immediately checked my temperature. It was 100.6, and my heart sank. Um, I immediately call the ER, tell them, hey, I'm one of the nurses that took care of Mr. Duncan, and I have 100.6 fever, and I'm coming in. And so I drive myself to the hospital, walk up to triage and tell them the same thing. They take me back to isolation immediately. Um, and I'm in the, in the ER and they start doing vitals and lab work on me right away. Um, and I'm in the ER for another 24 hours around until I get my diagnosis. Um, I remember the chief nursing officer and a CDC doctor coming into my room and full isolation hazmat gear, and um, I looked at my chief nursing officer, who I knew, and I saw his eyes were bloodshot red, and I knew right away that it was, it was bad, and he had been crying. So I, I, mean, I don't even remember exactly what he, what he told me, but I just remember just like breaking down and, you know, just at, and seeing Mr. Duncan die and fla that flash before my eyes just, what, two or three days prior so that was pretty much the scariest moment of my life. And so. So, so then, Nina, you, I think you hear something like this, I, I believe. The fact that we don't know of a breach in protocol is concerning because clearly there was a breach in protocol. How did that make you feel, Nina? Pretty shocked and hurt, to be honest. It, uh, I have to be honest with you, I am um, in Liberia at this point in time, and that's kind of, we're telling the story in real time as it played out. Uh, so I don't know why Texas didn't give Emory a call. I was two months there. I don't know why we spent three days training the Emory nurses, and then I had a chance to sit with them for 12 days, and Nina was forced to look at a computer. I have absolutely no call. Other, maybe pride, I don't know what it is. I really, truly don't. But I'm over in Liberia at this time. And I hear that quote, and I am furious. I'm angry. And I get a call from the New York Times in Monrovia. And I have to tell you that the, my original quote to the New York Times led the New York Times reporter to say, Sean, I cannot put the cuss words in there. You're going to have to give me something a little better. <laughs> and I said, not only was it wrong to blame the nurse, but that the CDC protocols... We're, not, we're dead wrong and absolutely irresponsible. That's what I said. And what Nina got to see last night or yesterday in, in our room is the actual official emails that I sent to CDC the day before she got sick. And the banter that CDC would fight back and saying what they were saying and what I was saying as we were, as we were doing this. So... The reality is, is that when I got home, Nina had a profound impact on my life. Nina and Amber did. When I came back after Nina and Amber got sick, it was chaos. I was met with a lawyer out of customs, had a sign, Mr. Kaufman. Now, we come from a blended family, and my ex-wife is a beautiful woman. She's a dental hygienist, beautiful woman. She's from Hellgate, but she said, I'm sorry, 
you can't see the kids for 21 days. I'm like, you knew that I had work. The most dangerous work I did was with Kent and Nancy. I mean, but the reality was is, man, it hit pandemonium. It was crazy now. Ebola had come to the U.S., and it was absolutely crazy. So people started doing all sorts of crazy stuff. <laughs> Let's not fly Frontier Airlines. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. So in all seriousness now, though, this is very, very important. We put this picture up here because obviously, look, this is, this is history. We, we can't be doing what we've been doing in the years of the past, and we can't be doing what we're doing today. So Nina, who has won the lottery and is providing lessons for us, what is it that you want as you move forward, Nina? I'm asking for four things. First off, transparency. I want the leaders of the hospital to be transparent with us about the risks involved that they're asking us to partake in. Secondly, I want empathy. I want them to ask themselves if they would do the same things that they're asking us to do. You know, in nursing school, we get taught that the pa we should advocate for our patients. And today, I want us to advocate for ourselves. Thirdly, I would like accountability. I want the, the leaders of the hospital to be accountable for their mistakes and own up to their actions. And lastly, I would like change. The difference between a lesson learned and a lesson ignored is change. And I hope by sharing my story today, um, I hope to inspire change in the future and that we will fight for better protection for our nurses and health care providers. So thank you, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Nina Pham. Ebola is really just the beginning. We have emerging infectious diseases that we should be much more worried about. And to solve a problem by throwing personal protective equipment out and then giving people the confidence, in essence, is to rely on that solely uh, while working with patients who are sick with some newly emerging infectious diseases that are dangerous, almost, in essence, gives people a false sense of security. And so the reality is, is that it's you know, the equivalent of teaching a child how to swim. You don't teach a child how to swim in a kiddie pool and then throw them in a big pool because they'll drown. If you're going to do something, you've got to do it all the way. And throwing personal protective equipment out and, and that's all you do to protect your healthcare workers, it's not enough. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the lessons learned. One of the things that, uh, that a lot of folks don't know, I'm going to tell you the back scenes of Emory. Emory may not even tell you this. Dr. Ribner came in and said, I thought we decided we weren't going to do this. It was going to be standard precautions. And the nurses looked at Dr. Ribner and said, Dr. Ribner, we're not happy with that. And Dr. Ribner stopped and he said, well, what will make you happy? And the nurses said, what Sean's telling us to do. And Dr. Ribner said, are you sure you want to do that? And they said, yes. And he said, then that's what we'll do. And he turned around and walked away. That was it. Awesome. That was it. <laughs> that's Emory's success right there. CDC was with Dr. Ribner when he did that. So CDC and Dr. Ribner walked away, and Emory went forward doing what it did. And thank God for that, because the Chick-fil-A incident would have been a really bad day for Emory. <laughs> Chick-fil-A would not be known in a very positive way. In order for us to have safety of any kind, we have to have a combination of the leadership and the workforce. It is definitely the role of the workforce to do several things. We'll talk about those expectations, but leadership, leadership has to check in because leadership has to prepare, they have to protect, and they have to promote the workforce. And if they don't, that's not leadership. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means a little later on. But let me tell you what I learned. So we were just moments into this. This is the Emory Isolation Unit. This was Nancy's room over here. This was Kent's room over here. Now, Kent came in, he walked in, he walked into the patient room and probably, I mean, literally collapsed. He did everything for his family. I mean, he was trying to show his family he was strong. He walked in that patient room, he collapsed, and Jill, my all-star nurse. So out of all the nurses we had left, I had one nurse. She's the ICU nurse. She was an ICU nurse. Man, she, was, she is a pit bull. 
man, attentive to every detail. Man, she's on fire. She was my favorite. She's in there. She greets them. And this is what begins to happen. So this is where infection control and containment don't, don't mix. Dr. Brantley comes in. He gets on the bed. Jill starts stripping him. And then she starts moving around the room. All over. Touch Dr. Brantley. Touch something else. Talk to Dr. Brantley. Touch something else. Put a mask on Dr. Brantley. Touch something else. This is a loss of containment. See, what you guys don't understand in a laboratory. In a biological laboratory, when we work with Ebola, we work with, if you look at a, a water bottle, lid, that quantity. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars in engineering. We spend thousands of dollars in spacesuits, and we put it in a $30,000 biosafety cabinet. That cabinet is encapsulated with directional airflow and HEPA filtered exhaust. And whenever our hands come out of that cabinet, they are completely deconned before we even get up and move around the lab. You're touching Ebola, and then you're moving around the whole room. You're losing containment. And I'm screaming. I'm banging on the window. Jill, 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 stop, stop, stop. We just got to stop. And we immediately went into this containment zone, which is, listen, whenever you get close to this patient and whenever you put hands on this patient, it is immediately a doffing of the outer gloves, sanitizing of the inner gloves, and then put on a new glove. And this is exactly what we started to teach. Meaning nurses had the construct of infection control, which was protection of the patient. But they did not have the concept for protection of them. And that was a huge discovery. And that's where we come back to. Look, infection control needs to be there. Don't feel threatened. There have been two barriers in the last year of doing this for nurses. The first barrier has been doctors. We've got this. We've got this. And then my comment to them is, yeah, you've got this for the five minutes you're with the patient. How about like the remaining 24 hours the nurses are there? I know you've got this. That bothers me. That's where that empathy comes in, where Nina was saying, listen, I'm on the front line. Can you listen to me like Dr. Ribner did, please? Because he did a great job in listening to his nurses. You know the second barrier I've run into? Nurses. Infection control nurses. They're intimidated and threat. Listen, I'm not here. I don't want to threaten you. I'm saying we can complement infection control with lessons from high containment labs. There's no reason we can't partner on this. There's none. In high containment labs, we don't use one control. See, a year later, this is the solution. You want to know what's happened? Hey, folks, we'll just give you a bunch of PPE, and you'll be okay. Here, we're just going to give you a lot of personal protective equipment. And you should be okay. If we do a little PowerPoint presentation on this. You feel okay. That's like me saying to a child who doesn't know how to swim, don't worry, I've got nice swim trunks, and I'll teach you with a PowerPoint. <laughs> and then I throw them in the pool, and you know what happens? They drown. And then guess who gets blamed? Dr. Frieden. Hey, you know, there's obviously a breach in protocol. How about a lack of leadership? How about a lack of accountability? See, in high containment labs, we use four primary controls to protect the workforce. We use engineering. That includes directional airflow, the hands-free sinks, self-closing doors. We use floors that don't strip with bleach because we know we have to decon the environment. We also use personal protective equipment for two reasons. Nina went home in her scrubs to her dog. Could have had kids. Hey, Mom. PPE is done for two reasons. The first reason is to keep whatever we work with in the lab in the lab. And the second reason is to protect all portals of entry. That's why we wear personal protective equipment and remind people of that. You can be as exposed to as much Ebola as you want, but if all portals of entry are protected, it's not getting in your body. We're okay there. Standard operating procedures. This is, blows my mind. When the work we've done with hospitals, I'll come in and I'll say to the nurses in the isolation units, okay, what are your SOPs? <laughs> what are SOPs? SOPs or SOBs, standard operating behaviors. We don't want you to think in the same way. We want you to behave in the same way because you have to when you're paying attention to the detail. You can buy as much PPE as you want, but if you remove it inappropriately, you're going to get sick. Now, guys, you don't need to learn that in a hospital setting because we have had deaths in laboratories. Beth Griffin died from an ocular exposure to herpes B virus. A, two CDC scientists died in the 80s as a result of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. We just had a gentleman from the University of Chicago die from plague, Yersinia pestis, and three from Boston University that got tularemia. 
look, guys, we have lessons to bring to the table. We know that you need to don and doff your PPE properly, and if you don't believe that, here's what I want you to do. Take a pair of gloves and go online and buy a, a bottle of glow germ. It's 30 bucks. Take a pair of gloves and put them on the outside of the glow germ like I've done for years with nurses. Have the nurses close their eyes because you don't look at taking your gloves off. You take them off so much you don't even pay attention anymore. Close their eyes, take their gloves off, turn the lights and turn on the lights and see where the glow germ is on their hands and you will be floored. It'll be all over their hands. Why do we even wear gloves? That's what you'll ask yourself. So SOPs on how to remove your PPE is critical. And then last but not least, this is the family. Training, not PowerPoint training. Like real training. Training on donning and doffing, making sure people can do it. Medical and incident surveillance. How do we know when people are sick? How do we know when incidents happen? How do we report them? SOP evaluation. All of these things is what we do. And today, I'll give you a free lesson, a consulting lesson. See, people always like to say, well, it's expensive if we start doing it. No, let me tell you right now. See, I don't understand why people come into the emergency room and you've got your triage nurse and your triage nurse looks just like this. Now, we know CDC has said that when we talk, we spit. <laughs> I've got influenza, droplet transmission. I've got TB, aerosolization. I'm speaking to you and spitting all over your workplace. What the, what is that, what is that? All you have to do is elevate the triage nurse so that now gravity's pulling everything down or you can go to Walmart and buy a $5 fan and blow it from her face to the patient so that when I'm talking, I'm not spitting on her. It's a simple concept. We walk into hospitals every month with these Google glasses on, and we just record. I'm just looking. Oh, my gosh, you would, see, you would die if you saw some of the things. Now, again, we have the hospital's permission. We just go back and review it and show what people are doing. But the concept of containment does not exist in infection control, and that puts you as nurses at risk because you're not idiots. Here's what I'm saying. If I'm a nurse and I have a piece of equipment that touches a patient, I go and I touch a patient with that piece of equipment, I come over here, I put it here, I go and I remove my gloves, and I move on. Another nurse that doesn't know that that piece of equipment has touched the patient comes in, does the assessment, oh, it looks at the patient's far away, no. grabs this, and it's not the nurse that actually touched the patient with this that suffers. It's the continued progression of the disease away from wherever the person is that's sick. And we had to learn that the hard way in science. We also learned using this biological risk mitigation process. If you think the greatest risk is the disease you're up against, it's not. The disease you're up against is fairly stable. It's looking for a Hilton hotel. It wants your nice, warm body to grow. A freezer will put it to sleep. Agents will kill it. It's, very, it's you. You're the greatest risk. Because some days you have good days and some days you have bad. You're going through divorces, marriages, having children. You like the people you work with, you don't like the people you work with. You're having a fight with your husband, a fight with your boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. You come into work sometimes paying attention to detail, and other times you're not. And that means that you're at risk when you're not fully focused on what it is that you're doing. And you all know that. But you know what a bigger risk than that is? I had to go to Congress and testify. Testify that, listen, lack of leadership and culture puts everybody at risk. Because if you have people who are breaking rules and nobody holds them accountable, then everybody's at risk. I want you to use a family approach. Think about that. What happens in a family when one of the children says to the mom and dad, leadership and safety, I'm not following the rules. And the mom and dad say, that's okay. Go ahead and break them. What do the other children do? They break them as well. There's no respect for the organization. There's no respect for the structure. Assessment, it's okay if science says one thing, but what do your staff say? Okay, look at Nina. Nina's amazing. She went into Ebola. Like, you have to understand, when I train people, the first time I trained somebody in Ebola, I put them in a spacesuit, and we weren't even going in a real lab. I put them in a spacesuit, I took the zipper, and I zipped it down, and the minute the spacesuit zipper got to the bottom of the suit, the person passed out. <laughs> Shaking. And we're talking about small quantity. We're talking tiny quantities in a very controlled environment. And here you are as a nurse, you're going in, and this guy, I mean, the explosion I saw... I will always be grateful for everything you all do. <laughs> I mean, my goodness, I'm going, whoa, whoa, you know, I'm trying to be a safety officer. 
You're doing, oh, we got to, oh. You've got to have uh, plans, strategic plans. You've got to think about things, and you've got you've to be able to communicate. Now, if you look at the greatest risk we face during this time, denial, fear, stigma, Ebola. This was, these, were the, these were fears. First, people would deny uh, in West Africa. They would deny that their fever was anything. Uh, they would say it was immediate malaria. They would start their malaria prophylactic treatment. When that didn't work, they would be afraid now that it could be Ebola, so they would flee to an Ebola treatment center away from the healthcare center that they were working in because they didn't want to be stigmatized if they were positive. Ebola fell in the middle here, but look, patient stability. This just blew my mind. We lost our minds. Science has clearly been able to articulate, listen, when someone is feverish, sometimes they test negative. Do you know why? Because their viral loads are so low that the reality is, is we can't pick it up even with science. And yet, when someone has a fever, we want to walk in looking like a stormtrooper and, you know, and, and put them in a little gurney. And wheel. I mean, come on. We have to use science when we make our decisions, folks. If someone comes in and they're feverish, I just got a fever, put them in a separate room that has space between you and the doctor or the nurse and screen them and interview them to see if they're a candidate. If they're in a serious situation, meaning they fit the criteria, please, Aiden, stand up for me. Stand up on the chair for me. Please don't take them where I'm taking my son to get an arm fixed or stitches done. I don't want patients that are potentially ill with Ebola in emergency rooms. Why on earth would we do that? Why would we try and, and bring them into the hub of that? And I'm not talking about Ebola anymore, thanks, son. I'm talking about influenza. I'm talking about all the other very dangerous emerging infectious diseases. Why on earth would we put them in a room off to the side, screen them, and if they have to go to isolation, put them right into isolation? Don't just bring them into the emergency room. Hey, what's the problem here? Oh, let me, as a doctor, put on a mask of something that's spread through aerosolization aspect of the family next door is breathing in your air. That's crazy. And what about waste disposable? What about waste from the patient? You've got all sorts of issues that you're running into if you think about that. You've got to think about stability because Ebola presents in different stages. When the patient starts having severe diarrhea and vomiting, now they're shedding the virus at high loads. Now you need that gear, guys. That's what we did in the field. We, did, we used space. Space is your natural friend in directional airflow. Again, the greatest risk we face is the risk of the preparedness of the workforce and how prepared the workforce is to do the work, and then even above that, the culture of the organization. The culture of the organization. Emory did not like me. They still don't. I left them. They got mad. Right after Kent and Nancy were un unloaded, I left. I, I had my own business. I just decided I needed to go to Belgium and Liberia. And Liberia. They got mad, very upset. Oh, well, the reality was is they had the right culture, though. So did Nebraska. I'm sorry to say, and you know, I don't want to offend it, but your hospital did not have the right culture. Hey, uh, you know, well, what are we going to do to prepare? Well, we're going to use a handout. And we're going to talk about that handout, too. If you are going to work on Ebola and you have these slides, there's no problem. But I want you to listen. Look, these are the SOPs you've got to consider. Donning and doffing. Your nurses better be able to say, check gauges, check signs. If you don't know what that means, that's important. Check gauges means you've got directional airflow. Check signs and make sure there's nothing up. You're going to enter the anteroom or enter the, the, the uh, locker room. Remove jewelry. Get naked. Don scrubs, don socks, don shoes. Enter the anteroom, don belt, don battery, check motor, put motor and hood set aside, don Tyvek suit, first pair of gloves, tape, second pair of gloves, don booties, plug in, put on, zip up, tie up, check gauges, check signs, enter patient room. Your nurses should be able to say that and then be able to do it. And then when they doff, the same thing. Glove change. Your nurses should take their gloves off in the same way. I am re boy, I'll tell you, they stick it to me. The beaking method, if you've all seen that. That was developed in the laboratory environment. We use the beaking method. It's called the beaking method for a variety of different reasons. But we teach nurses to take their gloves off without contaminating their inner gloves. You take your gloves off using a strategic way. If you use your own way to remove gloves, you're going to have inconsistent outcomes in safety. There has to be a good way, a, a golden standard for removing gloves. I think the beaking method works. We tested it. Over seven years ago, for two days in Emory, in the lab environment with Glowgerm, we did it every which way you could possibly imagine. 
We believe it truly works. But you have to decon. Room transfer. How do we get from room to room with a nurse who has to go from room to room? How do we transfer them? How do we do a lab sample uh, transfer? How do we do waste management? How do we do waste treatment in the toilets? How do we do re room decon? Look, bleach. This was, this was another thing that was killing me. Look, if you want to kill cholera or hepatitis B or HIV, go right ahead and use bleach. That's great. You want to kill Ebola? Use Dove. As soft as it is on your hands. <laughs> it interrupts the envelope. Ebola is a lipid envelope virus, folks. In science, it's the easiest thing to kill. The absolute easiest to kill. In Emory, we never once used bleach in the room with the patients. Not one time. And the, and the other day, I was at a presentation where nurses were talking about, well, we have to pre-treat the water with bleach. Listen, you sit on pre-treated water with bleach and see what happens to your mucous membranes. That's not a pleasant feeling. Use microchem, that's okay. Okay, it's a quad, that's fine. But the point I'm trying to get at is, you don't decon your room based on perception of fear and what you've always done. You have intelligence on the agent you're working against. Ebola, lipid envelope virus, easiest thing to kill. We are going to wipe this sucker down with sandy wipes. That's what we're going to do. We're going to take sandy wipes, we're going to throw them all over the floor, and we're going to use the Swiffer Sweeper. And we're going to make sure we are proactively deconning three to four times a day. And that's exactly what we did every single day. Took environmental swabs, nothing ever outside of the containment of the patient. You use your decon with the agent that you're working against, trying to get bleach in that room. I was like, listen, you can't have bleach in this room. Why? We use bleach all the time. Because the floors will strip before the patient even gets out. Because it causes irritation in your number one defense mechanism against disease, which is your skin. Why on earth would you break your skin down when we're trying to fight a blood-borne infection? You need your skin intact. Spill cleanups, big. Needle sticks and cuts. Room evacuation. What happens if there's a fire and you need to evacuate a high-risk patient with an infectious disease? Family visitation. Shower out policies. Restocking. That's huge. These are protocols that if you think you're ready and you don't have one of these protocols up, you better get it. This is something we did every single day, multiple times a day. Every single day, okay? Now, also, too, please, look at this SOP. Are you kidding me? I was so angry. You guys don't know. I'm sitting, if you can imagine, I get spotted email. Spotted email. Spotted H uh, uh, inter internet over in Monrovia. And I'm trying to send an email, and I'm livid. It's not sending. I'm getting angry. My mentor on the 10th, of October, which was two days before Nina got sick. She's already getting sick. My mentor sent this to me and said, have you seen what CDC has produced for healthcare workers? I said, no. He sent it to me. Now, you have to understand, for 12 years, my life is pretty boring. I love my life, though. I'm a trainer. That's what I do. I'm a behavioral psychologist. I love behavior. I walk into simulation labs around the world, and I make sure that everybody does the same exact thing, donning and donning. That's why I can stand up here and say it. And they remove their gloves the same exact way. I could look at this procedure because after 12 years of doing this with every single bit of PPE you can ever imagine, from Tyvek suits, booties there, I could look at this and go, wait, hold on one sec. They're having you remove your gloves first? Well, wait, look at your fingertips, ladies and gentlemen. Just look at them. You have cuts and tears on your cuticles. That's why we wear gloves. It's a portal of entry. They're having you remove your gloves first? Sanjay Gupa couldn't find glow germs, so he used chocolate sauce. As I told him, Sanjay, just do it with the glow germ and show people how stupid this is. And he got on CNN and did exactly what he was supposed to do. Look how this does not work. It blows my mind. And Nina, poor Nina, because she's right, who can argue with the CDC? Who can argue with it? I mean, the CDC knows that. The CDC didn't know this. And here's the neat part. When I worked at CDC for seven years, we used to go out to state health labs, our state departments, and you know what the neatest part is? You could always tell people who worked previously at CDC. You know why? Because when you walked into the state or a hospital, the ones that fell to the ground and kissed your feet, they thought you were CDC. The ones that were looking at you like, <laughs> I don't give a shit about you. Who are you? Those are the people that have worked at CDC in the past and realized that there are some serious morons that work at CDC. <laughs> I want everybody to follow this very basic SOP. I want everybody to close their eyes for me. Go ahead and close your eyes. This is what happens when we write plans. Close your eyes for me. Good? 
Now what I'd like everybody to do is fold that piece of paper in half for me. Go ahead and fold it in half. Everybody's doing awesome. Obviously, everybody can understand what I'm saying. They're doing it. I'd like for you to fold that piece of paper in half again for me. Excellent job. You're doing excellent. And I'd like for you to fold that piece of paper in half one more time. Good. One more time. Very good. Now, after you've done that, what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to tear the upper right-hand corner off for me, please. Go ahead and tear the upper right-hand corner off. Go ahead and tear the upper right-hand corner off. Very good. Now, if I've touched you, what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to go up into the front of the room. Everybody can open their eyes. If I touch you, go up to the front of the room for me. If I touch you, go up to the front of the room. Open your eyes. Okay, go ahead. Let's go up. I want everybody to stand shoulder to shoulder. Now, this is a very basic plan, very simple plan. Plans are supposed to get different people from different backgrounds to the same exact conclusion. I'd like for everybody to go ahead and open up your sheet of paper for me. And I'd like everybody up here to open the sheet of paper up for me, too, and show the audience. You all followed the same plan, didn't you? But how come we got completely different outcomes? And to be honest with you, I asked everyone to follow the SOP, which means it should look like this. I asked you to fold it in half. I asked you to fold it in half again. I asked you to fold it in half one more time and tear the upper right-hand corner. None of you listened to me. <laughs> or maybe all of you did. Very good. Thank you guys very much. So you got a plan. Wow. We know how good plans are. We know how good they were during Hurricane Katrina. They were floating down. Do you know why Hurricane Katrina had a plan? Hurricane Katrina had a plan because in 1968, Billion Dollar Betsy came in and did the same thing. Hey, everyone, let's write a plan. Let's have an Ebola plan. Great. There's your plan right there. Right up there. I just demonstrated how good it is. If you're going to have a plan, you better do a couple other things like this verification aspect. If I ask someone, how do you brush your teeth? They should be able to list exactly what they do. Then they should be able to demonstrate it. Same thing. There's critical aspects that nurses must learn and must be able to do, especially with the emerging infectious diseases that we face today. The last thing I want to show you before we take questions is Ebola was just the beginning, folks. And in fact, if you followed what was happening in South Korea, you would know that the healthcare when you, workers... When you look around uh, the world, I mean, we're talking about South Korea at the moment, we don't want to beat up on them. This, this could happen in any number of other countries Absolutely. in terms of preparation and training. Absolutely. The saddest part here again, and, and i got to keep stressing this because I saw it here in the United States, we saw it in West Africa, we're now seeing it in South Korea, I think the saddest part here is, look, we need to prepare our healthcare workers a lot better because they're on the front line. They're the canaries, in, in essence. And if the healthcare workers don't have the skills and abilities to treat the sickest of the sickest patients with these newly emerging infectious diseases, we put not only our healthcare workers at risk, but we put other people in the general public at risk as well. Guys, I think we can do better. Thank you all very much for your time. <laughs>